화면 속의 주인공 스튜어트 러셀 교수를 무대로 모시 Please join me in welcoming Professor Stuart Russell on stage. Thank you for the invitation to come. Thank you very much to our kind hosts. So I'm here to talk about my favorite subject, which is artificial intelligence. And Sebastian already explained that artificial intelligence is about making machines smarter. And I think he convinced us that this process is moving very fast. And we've all seen uh, the recent developments where AlphaGo defeated Lee Sedol, who was very gracious in defeat and represented the human race extremely well. Uh, but it was a very hard position to be put in. So we're going to see lots and lots of developments. Sebastian described some of those. Um, and so uh, we've already seen self-driving cars, although they're taking a little bit longer than some people might have been hoping. Uh, and if you've driven in a Tesla in self-driving mode, uh, you're probably not surprised that it's taking a little bit longer because it's often quite terrifying. Um, we're also going to see smart personal assistants. One of the big breakthroughs we expect in the next few years is the ability for systems to understand language and speech uh, so that they can actually follow your conversations, your emails, your texts, and understand your life uh, just as well as your husband or your wife does. Uh, and in that, in that way, they can help you uh, in every aspect of your daily activities. If you're a scientist, uh, you're quite familiar with the idea that the progress of science is so fast and the rate of publication is so huge that it's almost impossible to keep up. And the complexity of the theories that we're building, especially in biology, is enormous. And so we're going to have AI systems that will help us manage that process and increase the rate of discovery in science and particularly in medicine. So these are wonderful developments. And it seems inevitable, uh, unless climate change or, or an asteroid destroys us first, that uh, AI systems will become more capable uh, than human beings across a wide range of activities. And that means that they, they will be able to take into account more information. They'll be able to read everything that the human race has ever written. And they will be able to look further into the future, just like AlphaGo does on the Go board, except this will be not the Go board, but the entire world. And this one might describe as the biggest event in human history. So what I would like to think about is, uh, is that event necessarily a good thing? Uh, and uh, how should we approach it? So the upside is pretty clear. The upside comes from the fact that everything we have as human beings is the result of our intelligence. It's not the result of our big teeth or our scary claws or anything like that. It's because of our intelligence. So if we have more of it and we can use AI as a tool to magnify our intelligence, that will dramatically increase the capabilities of civilization. And as Sebastian pointed out, we'll be able to have uh, solutions to problems that have escaped us for centuries, the problem of war, the problem of disease, poverty, uh, and perhaps the destruction of the environment. All of these things can be solved uh, with a little bit of help. So we're going to move to a period where we are no longer constrained by the need to survive, the competition for resources, the things that have characterized all the bad things uh, about human history. We will have the chance to choose our own destiny, uh, and that's a very very heavy responsibility for our generation to figure out what the future is going to look like. As with any powerful technology, just like nuclear power has its upside and its downside, AI has its downside. And the downside is exactly the same as the upside. It's going to create an enormous increase in the capabilities of civilization. And some of you already know about some of those uh, applications of AI that maybe are not so welcome. One of them is the creation of uh, intelligent weapons that can choose for themselves uh, who to kill, uh, where to go, and what counts as a target. Uh, and this will be a new kind of weapon of mass destruction, where instead of destroying a city with a nuclear weapon, you can simply launch 10 million miniaturized devices that can kill everybody in that city. We're also going to see, unless we're very careful, uh, the application of 
intelligent machines to watch our every movement, to understand what we're doing, and to modify our behavior, to change what we buy, to change who we vote for, to change who we talk to, and how we manage our daily lives in ways that we may not be able to control as individuals. So this is another undesirable consequence. And a third possibility that many people have discussed is the idea that uh, a lot of the jobs we have now, which, to be frank, are jobs that use human beings as machines, uh, are going to go away. Um, so the idea that we will go and work for a large corporation and we'll do the same thing thousands of times every day for thousands of days until we retire, uh, that is going to go away, and we will have to find a completely new uh, system for our economy, our education, and our lives uh, in this new world so that we still feel that our lives have value. So these are some very important challenges, and many, many brilliant people are working on them. But there's one other challenge which um, is actually a little different. It's not the same challenge that we face with nuclear power or with global warming. It's the fact that if we're going to build systems that are more intelligent than we are, this might in itself constitute uh, a risky thing to do. And probably when you think about it, you think, yeah, maybe there is something not quite right about doing that. Is this really a good idea? And if you were a gorilla, so here are some gorillas having, uh, having a meeting. Uh, you can tell they're having a meeting because one of them has fallen asleep and actually fallen off his chair. Um, so the gorillas are discussing, was it a good idea for us, or actually for our ancestors, to create these humans? Right? These humans are much more intelligent than we are, and now, as gorillas, we no longer have control over our future. Uh, in fact, our future is entirely dependent on the goodwill of these humans, and we can't do anything about it. We don't even understand what the humans are doing because they're so smart. Do we want to be in the position of these gorillas? And I think the answer is no. We don't want to be in that position. So we have to understand what is the nature of the risk that might put us in the position of the gorillas. And the nature of the problem is that we could build AI systems that are incredibly capable, that invent new things we never dreamed of, that control matter, that control time, that modify our environment in the pursuit of some goal which is not the goal that we really want. Okay? Uh, we're so used to the idea that what we do with machines is we, we give them an objective and the machine carries out the objective. And usually when you give a machine an objective and you don't get it quite right, well, you can press clear, or you can press stop, or you can switch it off. But with a super intelligent machine, you can't necessarily do that. The machine is pursuing the objective you gave it, and you have no choice uh, but to try to stop it, uh, but just like uh, AlphaGo, you're not likely to win that game. And this is not just uh, restricted to AI. We see the same view of, uh, of how we specify objectives in economics, in statistics, in control theory. All, all of these disciplines, the objective is assumed to be provided by somebody else, and the, the machinery just pursues the objective. Now, this is a very old story. There's uh, a legend of King Midas that goes back to about 800 BC. Uh, king Midas was a legendary king, and he was given uh, the power to choose anything he wanted. And he said, what I want is that everything I touch should turn to gold. And uh, that was what he said, and that was exactly what he got. But unfortunately, that was not what he really wanted, because his food and his drink uh, and as shown in the picture, his daughter turned to gold, uh, and in some versions of the story, he died in misery and starvation. So this is a very useful lesson for the human race. Now, we can think much more, uh, in, much more in the near term. Imagine that we have a domestic robot, and the domestic robot is at home looking after the kids because uh, the parents are too busy and they, they have to stay at work, and the kids are hungry, and the robot goes to the fridge, and there's no food in the fridge. Oh, dear. The kids are really upset now. Um, oh, we see the cat. The robot sees the cat. Okay, well, you can imagine what might happen next if the robot doesn't understand the full range of human values, if it doesn't understand the... Uh, the 
sentimental value of the cat as opposed to the nutritional value of the cat, then uh, that could be the end of the robot industry, because it only takes one of those mistakes for us to lose faith in these kinds of machines. And so there's an enormous incentive, economic uh, as well as species survival, to try to solve this problem of figuring out how to get machines to understand what human values really are, so that if we give them an instruction that isn't quite right, they know not to do it. So we're really talking about changing the nature of the field of AI from the standard. The standard view is that an AI system is given some objective and it figures out how to achieve it on our behalf. That sounds right, but it's wrong. The new version of artificial intelligence, we're calling it provably beneficial AI. Eventually, it'll, it will just be AI, uh, because it will be taken for granted that AI is supposed to be beneficial, is that the machine has to behave in a way that we are happy with, even if it's not what we asked it to do. So how we do this is based on three simple ideas. The first idea is very straightforward, that the robot's objective is to maximize the realization of human values, to make us happy. The second point is a little bit counterintuitive. It says that the robot doesn't actually know what our values are. It's uncertain as to what it is we want, what will make us happy. But this is really important, as I will explain in a minute. And then the third question, well, how does it learn about the values? It learns by observing human behavior, and I will also explain that point. So the, the, uh, the second point, why it has to be uncertain, it's very simple. If the machine is uncertain about what it is it's supposed to do, the objectives that humans really want to have achieved, then the machine has an incentive to learn more by discussing it with us. So the machine that was helping King Midas should say, are you sure you want everything to turn to gold? Do you really want your food to turn to gold? And Midas says, oh, no, maybe not. Right? So this is how you want the machine to behave. You want the machine to accept correction. So if the machine is doing something wrong, you can say, actually, no, you've misunderstood, and here's what I really want to have happen. And very importantly, we want the machine to allow itself to be switched off. A machine that has a definite objective will not allow itself to be switched off, because that would prevent the achievement of the objective. So the only way we can be safe with machines that will still allow themselves to be switched off is that they have to have uncertainty about their objective, and they have to understand that humans, in fact, know better. And if we don't like what they're doing, the machine is better off being switched off, because that will help achieve whatever it is that humans want. On the third point, how do machines learn about human values? They do it by a method called inverse reinforcement learning. And this is a real scientific field. Uh, the definition is pretty simple. You're given some observed behavior, uh, let's say behavior of a human, and you assume that the human is approximately rational, that what they're doing has some connection to what they want. And then from that, you have to figure out what is the internal value system that is driving this behavior. So let's make this very concrete. Here's a picture of me this morning uh, with jet lag, waking up at 5.15 in the morning, uh, and I really need my coffee. Now, when you see me behaving this way, right, it's pretty clear what it is I want. Right? My objective, in this, at least in the near term, is to have coffee. So this is a very straightforward area. We humans do this all the time. We watch each other, and we understand each other's purposes. But this is a much bigger process. We can have uh, machines that read everything uh, that the human race has ever written, because most of what we've written is about human behavior. So it provides a huge storehouse of information from which machines can learn about the human value system. We also have access to all the television programs that are being produced around the world. And the machines themselves can observe human behavior directly. As Sebastian pointed out, every machine can observe what every other machine is observing. So there's a huge stream of information about human behavior to learn about human values. Now, human value systems are not simple. We don't all have the same value system, so robots have to understand the variation and cater to individual preferences. We also have to understand that humans are not perfect. So sometimes people do things that they really don't think are a good idea, but they're just you know, normal. We, we call it human. That's what being human uh, means. We're going to have much less sympathy for robots that behave that way. Uh, when robots do the wrong thing, we're going to be quite unhappy. 
And of course, robots are not responsible only to their owners, but they are responsible to the whole human race. So the result is that um, in this process of making explicit what the values are that drive what we think of as good human behavior, we will learn more about ourselves, and that's a very important thing. We'll also have, as examples, robots that will have to behave well, otherwise we won't like them very much and we won't buy them. So in some sense, robots will become good examples for how we should really behave. The other thing I think that will happen is that in the process of understanding the values of all the human beings on the planet, we will learn that, in fact, we have an enormous amount in common, that what we have in common is much more important than what we have not in common, that the differences are less important than what unites us as human beings. And on that note, I thank you. Kamsa Hamida.